Uh, hello everyone, welcome to today's video. I'm going to be talking today about the, some of the differences and some of the similarities between HPGRs, which are high pressure grinding rolls, and semi-autogenous grinding mills, sag mills. So this video is going to talk about the strengths and the weaknesses of these different technologies and it will hopefully, hopefully give you a picture of where you might want to use one or the other of these different technologies. So we're going to have to start with some cautionary statements. Um, view this video at your own risk because every ore is going to be different. Every uh, site is going to have its own particular requirements, it's going to have its own particular constraints. Some of what we're going to talk about includes equipment prices and the prices of consumables. So you might end up with a different uh, optimal case depending on what your price structure is in your particular situation. Energy prices will change. Uh, media consumption, not only do the media prices change, but the consumption rates are actually very difficult to predict at the feasibility level. So all of the generalizations that I'm going to be making here, they may or they may not apply to your particular situation. So again, use this at your own risk. So I guess the big question, are these two technologies equal? Are HPGRs and SAG mills completely interchangeable? The answer is generally no. Now I've spoken in the past about sag mills and the variations on sag milling. So there's bag milling, which is barely autogenous grinding. There is fully autogenous grinding or ag milling. So you see this video that's linked below if you want more on the sag mills. And I'm not going to say much more other than expecting that you understand what those mills are. High pressure grinding rolls are a um, they're not that new, but they, they're not that widely distributed in the hard rock mining industry, particularly in, in copper and gold and so on. Um, the way that they work is you've got a pair of counter-rotating rolls, and the rock is fed between those counter-rotating rolls. It gets nipped into the gap between the two rolls, and there's a, a high compression is applied that breaks the rock as it passes through the two rolls. The product that comes out of an HPGR comes out as a flake. So it actually comes out as a, a relatively hard, almost like a pancake. And that has to be then broken up to get the, the finer particles to, um, to, to fall out that you can then screen them. HPGRs are sensitive to the feed size and they really do not like tramp metal. So you need to have a very effective tramp metal removal system for an HPGR. Okay, so now we're going to talk through some of the objectives of your grinding circuit and then we'll, we'll see which one of these two technologies is the best suited to each of these different objectives that we might look at in a grinding circuit. So the first objective of the grinding circuit is to turn coarse rocks into small rocks, right? Turning coarse into fine. So the feed, we're going to start from the primary crusher product and then we're going to go all the way down to the ball milling stage. Where in HPGR you generally can't feed it directly from a primary crusher, you have to feed it into a secondary crusher and get down into the 75, micro, um, 75 millimeter size range. Then the HPGR can take it from there down to something on the order of a, of a 5 millimeter nominal diameter. Sag mills on the other hand they can handle very coarse feed up to and including the, the product size coming out of a primary crusher. So 150 millimeters is, is a common feed size to a sag mill. So transfer sizes of one millimeter, two millimeters is not unheard of in the sag milling range. And if you do not have a pebble crusher, then you can often go down much finer than a millimeter in terms of your, your effective transfer size. You can be down in the half millimeter size range. So sag mill wins the, the reduction ratio aspect because you can feed it a much coarser feed and it'll make a finer product. So the sag mill wins on this criteria. Next we'll talk about energy consumption. So the uh, objective of the grinding circuit is to make coarse rocks into fine rocks, but you want to do that with the least amount of energy necessary. You also would like to have a nice steady plant tonnage. So if you've got, uh, uh, let's say, an underground mine, 
that's feeding the plant at a constant rate where you have a conveyor system or a shaft that is hoisting, you don't want the sag mill bottlenecking the underground mine. So you might have a situation where the sag mill is not your desired um, machine. You'd be looking at an HPGR circuit because it does operate at a relatively steady tonnage. Again, this is a big picture here. If you, if you drill down, it's more of a constant volume machine than it is a constant uh, tonnage machine. And even then, there is some ore hardness effect on the HPGR, but it's much bigger in the sag mill. Sag mills have, can have a, vague diff, a big variation in throughput depending on ore hardness. So HPGR, yes to steady tonnage. Sag mills, not so much, and especially if you don't put a pebble crusher with the sag mill, you can really be at the mercy of the circulating load of pebbles as your ore hardness varies. Specific energy consumption is going to be less in the HPGR, but if you look at the whole circuit, including the conveyors, secondary crushers, and the ball mill too, because the ball mill is going to be bigger in an HPGR circuit than in a sag mill circuit, but overall, you should expect about a 10 to 15% lower specific energy consumption in an HPGR circuit once you've included all these ancillaries and you've included the ball mill. Now, a note here that if you have a sag circuit without a pebble crusher, you're probably consuming about 5% more energy than what you would be doing if you had a pebble crusher in there. There is a synergy that a pebble crusher adds to a sag circuit which you're losing if you have just an SAB circuit. There are ores that don't have this penalty, like Highland Valley Copper is an example of that, but in general, you're paying about a 5% premium for energy if you do not have a pebble crusher. So the HPGR wins on both of these categories. It has a steady feed, especially if you have an underground mine, it might be the best choice for you. It also has a slightly lower energy consumption but only by about 10 to 15 percent. This is ore specific. There are ores out there which, where this is much larger. In Boddington, we're looking at you here. But if you see a study where they say there's a 50 percent specific energy reduction going to an HPGR from a sag mill, that study hasn't been done right. It shouldn't be 50 percent. It might be 15. So if they haven't included all the ancillary equipment, you can get some ridiculously big savings, but those aren't real. So next we're going to talk about the minimum amount of equipment you need for these circuits. So we're going to talk about ancillary equipment and we're going to talk about the overall process plant footprint. So here's a pair of pictures I pulled off of Google Earth that show two Chilean copper mines. They're both about the same throughput. They're both about 100,000 tons per day. Sierra Gorda on the left is an HPGR plant. Confluencia on the right is an SABC circuit. You can see that the scales have been set so that they're equal in both of these pictures. And you can see here on the left, the blue box identifies the whole of the crushing and grinding system at Sierra Gorda, going from the primary stockpile all the way through the conveyor systems to the HPGR, secondary crushers, screens, bins, and the ball mills in the bottom left. Confluencia on the right hand side, you've got the stockpile, which is under the building on the right of the area that I boxed in red. And then the grinding circuit, sag mills and ball mills are on the left side, and there's a pebble crusher building squeezed in between the two bigger buildings. So the Confluencia circuit is a lot smaller in terms of footprint than what you see at Sierra Gorda. So the HPGR circuit, it has a lot of ancillary equipment. You've got your secondary crushers, you've got lots of conveyors, you've got lots of bins, you've got lots of screens, and you have a huge process footprint. An SABC circuit the only ancillary equipment you need to really consider here is the pebble crusher because it's the only thing that's different to a sag circuit without pebble crushing, obviously. Um, so it doesn't consume nearly the amount of effort needed to design a, a circuit if you have so few pieces of ancillary equipment. So the ancillary equipment in a sag circuit, it's generally going to be, you know, your stockpile feed conveyor coming into the sag mill. You're going to have a screen usually on the back end of the sag mill. You might have 
circulating conveyors may or may not have a pebble crusher. Uh, much less ancillary equipment and your process plant footprint is a lot smaller than it would be in an HPGR circuit. So the sag mill wins both of these categories. It's got less equipment and it's got a much smaller surface area required to install this equipment in. So next I'm going to talk about occupational health and safety and um, two main aspects of this are going to be dust generation and whether or not a circuit is suitable for indoor installation. The picture I'm showing on the bottom of this slide is a mine site in Canada where the conveyor between the sag mill and the HPGR circuit is completely enclosed in its own little building, that conveyor gallery that you see. If they did not enclose and heat that conveyor, the material, the ore would stick to the conveyor. Indoor operation, it really matters in poor climates. Occupational health and safety, dust generation on an HPGR circuit is probably going to be high. You're going to have a lot of secondary crusher dust generated. You're going to have a lot of dust generated around the screens. Every transfer point where you have conveyors transferring, that'll generate dust. The HPGR itself as a unit generates a little bit of dust, but it's not the, the culprit in the circuit. It's all the ancillaries that are generating the dust. Are HPGR suitable for indoor operation? In general, no. There are some low tonnage plants up in, for example, diamond mines in the Canadian Arctic, where you can shoehorn a small HPGR into a small plant, but those are for really low tonnage operations. These large copper mines, like I was showing on the previous slide, you just cannot possibly put all of that ancillary equipment, all those conveyors and the HPGRs into a building and be cost competitive. SAG circuit, Dust generation is pretty minimal. In fact, the main stockpile is usually about the only dust generation you have to worry about. Once the ore gets into the, into the grinding mills, it ends up wet. You're, you're doing wet grinding in most of these plants. So that right there suppresses the dust generation. So the sag mill wins both of these categories. Again, you've got much less dust generation and it's suitable for indoor installation in situations where you have to install a plant indoors for climate reasons or other reasons. So next we'll talk about feed preparation for a ball mill. Both of these grinding circuits have ball mills and obviously if you're trying to make feed for a ball mill there's a question of which of these two devices makes the best feed for your ball mill. So we're going to break this down into two aspects again. We're going to look at how steady the feed is to the ball mill. So the desire for steady feed to the ball mill comes around because of the cyclone pack. You don't want cyclone pack chasing variable flow rates. You want a nice steady circulating load. You want a nice steady pressure in your cyclones. So the HPGR ha gives you a pretty constant feed into the ball mill circuit, as we've described earlier, where the sag mill does not. You're gonna be chasing a different throughput through a sag mill depending on ore hardness and other things. So the steady feed, the HPGR, is going to be better for the ball mill circuit in that sense. Your cyclone clusters are going to work a lot better. Now the quantity of fines that are fed into the ball mill circuit, that's another aspect where the more fines that come out of the primary grinding stage, the easier the job is for the ball mill. So in an HPGR, there's a mechanism called microcracking, which generates extra fines to what you would see coming out of something like a, a cone crusher circuit. But the sag mill also has a mechanism to generate more fines. The mechanism in a sag mill that generates extra fines is called the phantom cyclone effect. And it generally, really round numbers, you know, your, your mileage may vary. The phantom cyclone effect is about twice as effective as, as the micro cracking is in generating fines for the ball mill. So in general, a sag mill is going to give you more fines to the ball mill but the HPGR is going to give you a much better feed. So it's actually going to be a draw. The HPGR wins for the steady feed and the sag mill wins for the phantom cyclone effect giving you more fines. We'll talk now about circuit maintenance and circuit availability. So because crushing circuits are 
There are lots of pieces of simple equipment in, a, in an HPGR circuit, including things like cone crushers and screens and conveyors. All of these, you can run them at pretty high availability. There are examples, you know, even going back into the 1950s with cone crusher crushing circuits, where you can get 95% availability going into uh, an overall circuit, as long as you've got enough surge in the right places so that the maintenance on the crushers and the crusher unplugging doesn't affect the ball mills. So 95% availability on the ball mill side is achievable when you have an HPGR circuit. Ease of maintenance of an HPGR circuit. Now, please feel free to disagree in the comments if you don't like what I'm about to say. But an HPGR circuit is going to be simple to maintain in the sense that you don't need a lot of special tools to do it. You might need some special jigs to remove the rolls out of the HPGR, but you don't need anything as complicated as a liner handling machine to do maintenance on an HPGR circuit. The sag mill availability, in general, you're going to be in the 90 to 92% availability rate. And it's part of the reason for that is you're generally, you don't have any surge between the sag and the ball mill. So maintenance on the sag mill has an immediate effect on the ball mill and can bring the ball mill down. So 90 to 92% availability on a sag mill is doable. There are situations where people get up to 90 to 96%. But that's not common. Generally, um, 90 to 92 is a more be is a better number for people to use. One of the issues around the sag mill is to get high availability, you need some very special, very expensive tools like the liner handling machine. It is possible to have a small sag mill that you can do maintenance on without a liner handling machine, but handling liner segments by hand, it's hard work, it's dangerous, and it takes a long time, so you're going to have longer maintenance outages without that specialized liner equipment. So the HPGR wins both of these categories here because it's easier to maintain, even though there's more equipment, you have simpler equipment, and you don't need as many um, complicated tools to maintain it. You should be able to get a higher overall availability, especially when you're looking at the ball mills out of the HPGR circuit, as long as you've got enough surge in the circuit. So we'll talk now about the financial aspects of these. And again, we're going to break this down into two categories. You've got your operating costs and you've got your capital costs. This is very, very generalized. And you need a full-on feasibility study where you go all the way to like layouts, looking at the terrain, getting quotes on equipment, getting quotes on consumables, knowing what power price is in your jurisdiction and so on before you can really do this properly. But at a really high level, I'm going to say that the HPGR is going to be the most expensive circuit. The sag mill is going to be the least expensive circuit. And I've included an autogenous circuit in here because it can be intermediate in capital cost between the sag and the HPGR circuit. Fully autogenous grinding mills have to be bigger than sag mills, so you're going to pay a little extra for those. But the operating cost on the sag mill circuit is going to be the most expensive. Right? You're consuming balls in the sag mill. That is something you don't have to deal with in these other two circuits. The HPGR, yes, you have tires that have to be replaced on the rolls, but generally you're not going to see the cost of those consumables outweighing the cost of the savings in grinding balls in a sag circuit. The fully autogenous circuit, I'm saying it's the lowest operating cost because there are situations where you can have fully autogenous primary grinding and secondary grinding so that's pebble milling and there are some circuits in Europe that have extremely low operating costs operating fully autogenous egg mills and pebble mills. Very much use this table at your own risk. Each site is going to have its own particular quirks at this big picture though, you can see where the benefits of the HPGR are. They're on the operating cost side. You can see where the benefits of the sag mill are. It's on the capital cost side. So which circuit wins? It depends. It depends whether you're focused on your operating cost or whether you can afford the high capital cost associated with an HPGR or an autogenous circuit. If you're very capital constrained, you're going to a sag circuit. If you have a long mine life and you want the low operating cost, you, that might push you towards a fully autogenous or an HPGR circuit. 
So in summary of the benefits, sag mill, you have a better reduction ratio. You, you don't need as many stages of grinding to go from your primary crusher to your ball mill. The sag has a better ball mill compatibility in the sense that you have a finer transfer size. The sag has much less ancillary equipment. It has much lo a smaller footprint. You can fit it into places up in the mountains of the Andes where you couldn't possibly lay out a great big HPGR circuit. But if you're in the middle of a, of a nice flat desert with relatively benign climatic conditions, you might not care that you need a big footprint. You, you could lay out your large grinding circuit and it's not a big deal. The SAG is going to be the lowest capex, but it's not going to be the lowest operating cost. Fully autogenous might be the lowest operating cost. It depends on your ore. HPGR has the benefit of steady feed, and that's good both upstream in terms of your mining compatibility and downstream in terms of operating your ball mill. HPGR will generally be the lowest energy consumption out of all of these circuits. So if you're energy constrained, you're probably going to be looking closely at an HPGR circuit. There's going to be less media consumption in an HPGR than in a SAG circuit, but not necessarily less than in a fully autogenous circuit. HPGR, you should be able to get higher availability out of it, and the maintenance is easier, but it's still not easy. And when I say easier, again, you've got simpler equipment that is easier to maintain with the standard tools that you might have. You're going to have lower operating costs in general in an HPGR circuit versus a SAG circuit. But again, it could be very or and site specific depending on things like labor costs. So we've got these two circuits. The winner is, it's you, the customer. You have a choice between two mature technologies, each of which has particular strengths and particular weaknesses. Depending on what the needs of your project and your company and your cash flow are, you can choose the one that's the best fit for you. Each one of them has their own little compromises. Each one of them is particularly good in one or another aspect. You get to make that choice and choose the circuit that works best for you. And with that, I'll say thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you in the next video. Bye-bye.